Hello and welcome to Live from the Lab. This is the show where we look at different technologies that Brooker has developed to help scientists uncover the world around us. Today's topic, X-ray fluorescence. In fact, WDXRF. Now in a second, we're going to learn a little bit more about what WD actually is. Now the other part of this is, though, beyond the bench top. So in a previous episode, if you haven't seen it, we did talk about the Jaguar, which is a benchtop WDXRF unit. Now WDXRF, or XRF in general, is an important technique to have in your lab. It gives you the elemental composition. So other techniques, such as X-ray diffraction, that deals more with the structures that are present or the phases that are present. A technique like X-ray microscopy, that'll give you an idea of uh, the overall morphology of the sample. In fact, one example I like to use sometimes is to talk about baking a cake. So with, uh, with XRF, that'll tell you, you know, there's carbon present. There's, uh, you know, all these, uh, you know, different elements that are present. But it won't necessarily tell you how they're present. X or D, on the other hand, that's going to tell you, you know, if there's sugar or flour, things like that. And then X or M is going to tell you how that's all arranged. So all important pieces of the puzzle, all important tools to have in your toolbox. So to learn a little bit more, we're going to head on over to the table and talk with one of our experts. Good morning, Julia. Good morning, John. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. So, WDXRF, what does that mean? So WDXRF means Wavelength Dispersive X-ray Fluorescence Spectrometry. Um, you mentioned before we have EDXRF and WDXRF, just a quick reminder, ED stands for energy dispersive, so we have a tube, a sample, and a detector, and all of the resolution um, and the intensity is determined by the detector. With wavelength dispersive, we have a tube, a sample, and then we have optical components, namely the collimator and the crystal, that will help with the resolution and with the um, intensity. And so the crystal is there to um, diffract into the whole angle and the detector goes around that room angle and determines what element is present. Okay. It's a little technical but you can either look at the yep. old video or I can go into more <laughs> detail a little later if we have any specific questions. So when exactly would you use one of these ED XRF machines and when would you prefer the WD XRF machine? So ED and WD XRF can either work together, so an EDXRF could be a backup for a WDXRF. Um, WDXRF have better resolution, they, have, they can reach lower um, detection limits, um, but EDXRF on the other hand um, measures the whole spectrum all the time, so it's kind of a nice thing if you, if you have to screen things or if you routinely measure something and if you want to go back to it and see why there was something wrong. On the other hand, WDXRF, as I said, gives you better, um, better uh, resolution. It also can measure lighter elements. So if you need to measure fluorine or nitrogen or the carbon that you mentioned, um, that you can only do with the larger floor standing models. And then the, the other thing is speed, right? So EDXRF, yes, to get to certain margins and to get to certain repeatabilities, um, you could measure longer. Um, but with the larger floor standing WDXRFs, we can, for example, measure the 10 um, elements that are needed for cement analysis um, in less than five minutes. Okay. So then the other part of the equation for today is this whole beyond the bench top. So now when we talk about EDXRF versus WD, um, is there a certain form factor that they typically come in? Yeah, the WD system, the large floor, I mean, I say large floor standing, right? So it's a bit larger. Yeah, it's not that big. <laughs> it's big as like a washing machine, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, about. a very expensive yeah. washing machine. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't wash your clothes, no. just to be clear. No, that's true. Um, the ED systems are usually sm smaller, the ones that we yeah. have. Um, if you have a floor standing 4 kilowatt system, you also need to think about having a chiller because that is a lot of power that needs to yeah, dissipate yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> so so e it sounds like EDXRFs ED typically are a little bit smaller. They're either bench tops. Correct. I know handhelds, right? Those also use that yes. EDXRF. Yes. But then WDs, they start at bench top, something like the Jaguar, S6 Jaguar. Yes. And then we go up to the S8 Tiger. That's a full standing, freestanding, uh, four kilowatt. Correct. Full also, power machine. Also, the, the bench tops you can plug into a normal wall outlet, whereas for the um, large systems, you need to have a specific um, uh, setup. Okay. Okay. So um, 
that that's a you know, I mean, there's a lot of choices then, right? Yes. Um, and so I guess part of today's question is going to be, which one do you go with? So again, if you want to learn more about the Jaguar, we actually have a live from the lab that we previously did. Okay. If you want to know about the Tiger, though, let's watch the video that Julia brought. Thanks uh, for coming back here. So the Tiger, uh, that's, that's a pretty cool machine. It looks like a lot of features. Yes. And you can run a lot of samples. Huh? You can run a lot of samples. Yeah. So going back to the features, you have four collimators and eight crystals, as you saw. So that oh gives you a lot of flexibility. Fully loaded. Yes, fully loaded. Um, but yes, talking about all the samples that you yes. can run. So you saw this tray, and I have a tray here so you can see it a little better. So that's what it looks like, right? Four by five, mm -hmm. so 20 samples at once and then there's another one yeah. and then there was even um, uh, a part in the back so sometimes when I mean, we get samples and have to lot, run a lot of them we yeah. just load them up and yeah. walk away and, and you then can even it does set it overnight set it up with the automation thing right you so can I also set it up with there. automation yes yeah. um, and that also is one of the things that makes them so compatible with each other i yeah. said it's a backup right so you can put this um Maybe you have a PM going on, and yeah. then you need your double, but you still need to run samples, right? You can take this and put it into your S6, or you can put really? it into your S2. Wow. Um, you also can put these into a D8, so it's compatible uh, between techniques as well. Yeah, yeah, so um, the Endeavor, uh, I can't remember if we've talked about that before on Live from the Lab, but there is a, a, there's a video about the D8 Endeavor, and yeah. Yeah, sure enough, there are those uh, trays. Yes. So you could just walk the tray from one machine to the other. Correct. Um, or you could have that conveyor belt connect. Yeah. And in that instance, actually, XRF is a little bit faster than XRD. Could be, so yes. You, yeah, I know a lot of places out there, what they'll do is like two or three XRFs, in fact, to every one. Or yes. two, two or three XRDs for every one XRF. That XRF is so fast. Um, 
So uh, it looks like you have a bunch of different sample preps here too, right? So yes. we have some like fused bead type thing here. Yeah, so these are just examples of what kind okay. of sample cups we have. Yeah. So this, as I said, um, I didn't mention that. This is the easy loaded tray. So okay. because it loads easily, yes. right? It has different um, openings. So a little smaller, a little mm -hmm. larger, very small. Um, if you have a liquid sample or a powder, you would fill it in a cup and put it in. This okay. cup is not fully assembled, obviously, but that's what it would look like. Um, we also have a slightly different configuration for that's kind of more of the traditional um, sizes that you see in the metal industry. Yeah. They are larger, so um, Dan will actually show that later in the lab. Those are the two-part cups. Okay. Um, and there you can exchange the base plate um, to smaller sizes. So um, these are the more common configuration that we see just because yeah. it's so easy. But um, if you have larger samples or if, if you have other reasons for going for the two-part ones, for example, if you want to do mapping, then that's available as well. Mapping, interesting. So so you can actually use this machine. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty big beam. Yeah. So you mask it down or something? Yes, you collimate it okay. down to either 0.3 millimeters or 1.2 millimeters, and then it yeah. can raster scan um, over your sample. So that... I mean, yes, you can do full mapping, right? But Brooker also offers systems that are made for that. But it is yeah. very good to show you if you have impurities or mm -hmm. if you have like inhomogeneities in your sample. Yeah. Um, the, a good example is um, glasses, right? Yeah. So if you, we have some customers who work with glass, and if you're a big glass manufacturer and you get, you can see there's an like an inclusion, mm -hmm. you can put that into your XRF machine. Um, you could cut it down to something like this, or you could map it, so then you could also see what's maybe right around that inclusion that you can physically see. Yeah, oftentimes I think in, in the materials world, there's this assumption of homogeneity. Yes. And it's, it's, it's not always there, especially when you um, scale that up to the process level, right? Yeah. Now, one though important difference, right? You had mentioned that there are other solutions. There's uh, like the M4 Tornado and such, and that does do mapping, but that's ED. Correct. So this would actually be WD mapping. Yes, that will be WD mapping. But okay. don't forget, you're looking at a very small spot. So yep. you have to keep certain limitations in mind. Okay, so, so a, lot of, a lot of little things to consider uh, there. Um, so with that, what we're going to do is we're going to head on over, actually over in the lab, uh, Dan is set up, and he's going to show us the uh, tiger in action. Hey, welcome to the XRF lab. As you recall, XRF is a technique to look at different elements and different types of material. One of the simplest ways to do this is by energy dispersive systems. Now, an energy dispersive system could be something like a handheld unit, which you point the sample to the point the unit to the sample and get results. Or it could be something like a bench top unit that we see here. Now, one of the disadvantages with energy dispersive systems is that it's lower in power. Also, it has a lot more line overlaps. So if you have an application that you need to step it up a little bit, you might want to go with something like a benchtop wavelength dispersive system. Now, if you want to learn more about benchtop wavelength dispersive systems, we have an episode about the S6 Jaguar on live from the lab. Now, the benefits of going from energy dispersive systems to wavelength dispersive system is that you get better resolution and that you get more intensity. So the benchtop unit is nice, but it's much smaller. So it doesn't have the flexibility to one of my favorite units that we see over here, which is a floor standing wavelength dispersive system called the SA Tiger. It has a lot more flexibility than the, the S6 Jaguar. By, what I mean by that is that it has the capability of having more crystals added to it and also more collimators added to it. Also, it's a very powerful unit, which ranges from one kilowatt all the way up to four kilowatts. Now, I've talked about adding more, you have the choice of adding more collimators and more crystals to this, but why would you want to add more collimators or more crystals? Basically, it's better resolution or more intensity. Now, in this system here, we can add up to four collimators. Um, the difference between the collimators is if we take a look at these, is the planes that are inside there are parallel to one another. Now, if these planes are closer together, we get better resolution. If they're further apart, we get more intensity. Then we also talked about the crystals where we can add up to eight crystals in this unit. 
Now, why would we wanna add another crystal? Like I mentioned earlier, better resolution, more intensity. Um, we have crystals that allow us to look at elements from oxygen all the way up to americium. Those are like the three standard crystals that come with every system. However, you can add like a, uh, you can change out like the PET crystal for a germanium curved crystal, and that will give you more intensity for phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. Or you can change out like the lift 200 crystal for the 220 crystal, or have it with the 200 crystal to give you better resolution. Now, this is more powerful, gives you better overlaps, or excuse me, gives you better resolution, it gives you more intensity. Everything's great with this instrument, and it's very easy to use. Basically, to run a sample on the system, you put it into one of the sample cups that you see here, and you type in the sample ID name and press start. Sample prep of the sample preparation is very easy to use as, to do as well. So if you want to make a sample, you can run it as a liquid, you can run it as a loose powder, you can make it as a fused bead, or even press it into a pellet. So let's go back to the sample prep lab, and I'll just show you examples of each one of these um, sample preparations. Come with me now. Hey, welcome to our sample prep lab now. We just got done talking about how to run different types of samples in the XRF units. Now, I just wanna show you a quicker or a closer look at what these samples look like. Now, if you were gonna run a, a sample like a liquid or a loose powder, you're gonna use the plastic assembly that you see here, and you're also gonna use some sort of film, like proline or mylar, but there's a lot of other options that are out there. When you assemble it, you get a cup that looks like this, and then you pour your liquid sample in there or pour your loose powder sample in there and we run the sample just as this. Now, if you wanna step it up, we can. We can grind the sample and when we grind it, we use like a, a grinding vessel that's made of hardened steel or tungsten carbide and we add like a binder material to it. Um, usually we press, usually we grind about 15 grams of sample with one gram of binder, but it's different for different types of samples that are out there. Um, and then we usually press it for about 30 seconds at 30 tons, and then uh, we have a press pellet. Then the next way of running a sample is by fused beads. And how to make a fused bead is basically you take the sample, you heat it up in the fusion machine um, with uh, lithium tetraborate, lithium metaborate, and that will form the glass bead that we see here. So let's go back to the XRF um, lab, and we'll show you how simple it is to run a sample. And then we'll turn it over to Julia. All right, I brought the press pellet sample with me and we're back here in the lab. What we're gonna do now is show you how easy it is to run a sample by XRF. So what I'm gonna do is take the sample that we prepared, put it into the cup, close it, and then we're just gonna put it into the position. Once it's in position, we just select the application that we want. Um, for example here, we're just clicking on this program and then we're just gonna type in the sample ID name. Once the sample ID name is put in there, we'll hit complete, highlight the sample, and then we just hit measure. Now when the sample is done running, the results will show up here, and that's how easy it is to run a sample by XRF. All right, so uh, that was really interesting to see yes. the machine in the, uh, in the lab. And uh, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get to some questions that have come in. So we do actually have questions that came in before the broadcast. In the future, in fact, uh, for episodes, if you see a topic you're interested in, you can always send those questions in. The email address is live.events at brooker.com and we will get them either answered in the episode or after the fact. So if you do have any questions though right now, Go ahead on the side of your screen in the YouTube interface you can type in uh, your questions so the first question comes from actually I'm gonna say this Victor is telling us that he bought his first tiger in 2012 Wow that's great I love to hear longtime Happy customer out 10 there. 10 year anniversary with the S8 <laughs> that's right Victor and it, and it sounds like you said first so I can only assume that there's more <laughs> in fact, the recent Tiger, uh, that came out just a few years ago, right? Yes. There was a refresh. Yes. It has um, better hardware, longer or more linearity for the, for the high yeah. accounts. It's yeah. faster. It yeah. looks cooler, I think. 
<laughs> it does. It does. I like the screen now because it's yes. kind of got this integrated little bit. So let's get. Let's get. I'm gonna. We're gonna get to the hard questions for you now, Julia. So the first question actually uh, came in right before the broadcast from Master Melt. Can this technique be used to determine the portion of the total carbon in cast iron? And I'm gonna throw you for a little bit of a loop here. Existing as graphite. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yes, you can measure carbon yeah. in steel or cast iron. Um, you may need to make sure that you have basically mirror finish because we need to have a very smooth, flat surface. Looking at light elements, that's very important because we don't go into the, um, into the sample that much with light uh, elements. Uh, so impurities can influence your precision. Um, we cannot determine if it's graphite or um, a compound with the iron. Yeah. Um, we can just say, is it, gra is it carbon or not? So if you wanted to see um, more about that, you might want to do XRM, if it's small enough, or XRD for the, for the structure. Um, yes, that's, that's what I can tell you. But yes, there yeah. are lab reports, there are notes on how you can measure carbon in steel. And there's also OES um, optical emission yeah. Yeah. that you can use as well. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes we'd always like to say, oh yeah, this is a, this is a silver bullet. This is always going to solve every one of your issues. Um, but the reality is, is that it's really, it's about having all the tools that you need, right? right. You, can't, you can't build every project with just a Phillips screwdriver. There's not a single instrument that can do that. Otherwise, right. we all wouldn't be here. That's know? right. That's right. And that's yeah. an important point too, is that um, not only Brooker, but you know, whoever it is, is providing your solutions. Um, they often have access to all these different techniques. So it's great to, you know, send those samples in and we'll measure it in all the different methods. Um, in particular with the graphite thing though, um, XRD might actually be of help. If you get a lot of carbon into that lattice, I mean, that's basically steel. So the carbon incorporates into the iron lattice. It actually causes a slight lattice parameter expansion. Might be able to measure that. Uh, also, we might be able to pick up the, uh, the, the actual graphite. So uh, it's always one of those, you know, work with us, let us know, and uh, we can get you the right answer. So uh, next question that came in, actually this one came in before the episode is from Tom. And the question is, what were the powers that are available on these machines? Um, so the EDXRF is 50 watt. The benchtop WDXRF is 400 watt. And then the SA Tigers come in one kilowatt, three and four. And the difference between those three is the one kilowatt doesn't need an external chiller. Um, and the three and the four kilowatt have higher throughput, higher mm -hmm. power. Um, and if you want to measure light elements, let's say if you want to go down to boron or oxygen, um, you might also benefit from having um, more intense or more power just because you excite more uh, of the uh, element that you're uh, interested in. Okay. And one thing that you had said there is that you don't need a chiller even with the big one, really, the right. one kilowatt big yes. tiger. Yes, the one kilowatt. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so what do you need for that machine? So you need just a plug, huh? Yes. And I'm guessing But not the normal wall out Not plug. the normal one. No. Yeah, no, this has to be a real power plug. 208, yes. right? Yes. So, or, or 220, whatever that number is, that 200 thing. That's, that's what you need. Okay. Uh, and actually, this leads right into a question uh, from Susan. And she works for a third-party lab and is asking, which machine is your favorite? <laughs> Great <laughs> question. Um, my favorite actually is the one kilowatt because it... Really? It's kind of the sweet spot, right? It has the eight crystals, the four yeah. collimators. You can measure anything. In fact, we screen pretty much everything that comes in yeah. um, with the four kilowatt, uh, the one kilowatt as well. Yeah. We sometimes even help out our colleagues in XRD. Yeah. Um, that is right. That is right. Yep. In case they see some structures that they didn't expect. Um, and I have time. I don't need to run hundreds, 200 samples per day. So okay. waiting a little longer is not a problem for me. So I think for research or for just getting a machine that gives you great repetition, great um, accuracy, and also a great way of measuring what edit, whatever sample you throw at it, the S8 one kilowatt is, is really good. So it gives you access to all those benefits of the platform. It right. gives you all the extra crystals, gives you the monochrometers, gives you, um, or I should say, collimators. collimators. Yeah. Mono, we're not, in, <laughs> not at a synchrotron. It gives, gives, you, gives you all that. Yeah. Those, those accessories, uh, but it stays kind of economical. Correct. So, and it's a little bit more green. 
Only using yes. one kilowatt. So <laughs> it might measure longer. That might compensate. Um, all right. So let's see here. Uh, here is the next question, and that is from a guy that watches YouTube. Uh, is it recommended to make separate calibration curves for pressed and fused samples? Yes. Same type of sample. We have poor accuracy running pressed powders on our curve made using fused beads. Yes, definitely. Um, you want to make sure that your calibration mimics the samples that you want to measure as closely as possible. So if you want to measure fused beads, make a fused bead calibration. Um, and to get a step farther, um, use the same flux for your unknowns and for your calibration standards. That's not saying that you can't use the algorithms and the, uh, the calculation mm -hmm. power of your software to, to um, correct for that, but it's better if you can make it as close to um, what you're trying to measure as possible. And then for your press pellets, the same thing, right? You want to use the same preparation um, for the press pellets, for the standards, and for your unknowns. This also makes sure that you avoid errors in sample preparation if you always okay. do the, kind of the same yeah. thing, right? Um, we do have standardless calibrations, and these are made with several different standards. And obviously, then we use um, calibration not calibrations, calculations within the software to make sure that it works with all kinds of different samples. Um, but obviously, accuracy from standardless is not as good as it is for custom calibrations. Okay. So, actually, one question that I have now, uh, you know, I'm not the expert that, uh, in the XRF, is uh, I hear this pressed pellet, fused, which one actually, like, why would you do one thing versus the other? So, pressed pellet gives you higher... Um, intensity, so it's very good to measure traces. Okay. Um, but fused beads melt your sample, so they get rid of all of these mineral phases. Mm -hmm. It makes it possible to, for example, get in some um, standards that might not matrix match, but have the right elements in them. Okay. Um, so you can expand your your calibration range that way, and again, you can you you don't have to worry about what type of um, uh, mineral phases are in your samples. Okay. So I guess speaking of matrices and uh, specifics like that, we kind of have this uh, some I have a question that came in from Kelly. Can this be used to measure organic matrices? Yes. Um, in fact, one of the big um, new topics or, or areas that we're breaking in is uh, measuring food and feed. And most of this is measured with EDXRF because it's very, mm -hmm. it's actually a very simple analysis. We're not measuring the organic part, right? Mm -hmm. We're measuring what um, traces are in there, what nutrients yeah. are in there, and it's a very simple, um, simple measurement. Uh, actually, when you m compared it to baking in the beginning, there's yeah. also an application you could measure the amount of titanium in your flour yep. or in your bakeware to see how much whitener is in it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember one day I came in the lab and uh, you guys were like measuring chicken. Yes. Oh, yes. You did. <laughs> you can measure the amount of calcium in chicken. Really? For yes. You can okay. Do that. And that's something that's like yeah. a very yeah. important thing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you can measure like yeah, you can. A lot of you things. can also measure milk or milk powder. My <laughs> really? colleague. Yeah, my colleague did that. She, okay. She recently had a baby. Yeah. And you know you can buy the pre-made um, yes. milk. Oh, so much easier. Yeah. Yes. And you can buy the powder. <laughs> and so she prepared it with the, the powder yes. the, according to the, the recipe on the box. Yep. Um, and then she compared it, and there was actually more calcium and potassium, whatever the nutrients were, yep. in the self-prepared one than in the uh, liquid one. Oh, my gosh. Yep. Wow. The things you learn yep. uh, with these techniques. All right. Let's go back to our questions here. From um, Satish Kumar. I calibrated with an 8-gram sample and a 2-gram binder. Does using 10-gram sample and 2-gram binder make a difference in the results? Yes. Um, if you do 20% binder and that's how you calibrate, and then you reduce your amount of binder, um, your intensities will be higher, right? So if you don't tell that to the software, it will give you wrong results. However, you might be able to set up your application in the end uh, to accommodate for different, very, uh, different amounts of binder and sample. Okay, there we go. 
And the next question is from, actually, they, these are kind of, okay, two together, but we'll start with the first one uh, from Maria. Uh, which machine do you use for cement, in particular C114? Okay, so all of our systems that we mm -hmm. talked about can pass C114. C114 is an ASTM standard okay. um, to make sure that cement is um, according to standard, but it also involves the operator who's running it. But mm -hmm. the machine part can be passed by the S2, the S6, and the S8. Okay, so either ED or WD. Yes, yeah. most likely the ED is used as a backup because, again, yeah. the throughput, the accuracy, that's just something that you get faster and more easily with the S8. Okay, so now if I was just though a random person coming in from cement and said, hey, I want to get into this whole XRF thing, uh, which machine would you recommend to me? I would recommend the S8. Okay. Um, I would ask you how many samples you have, me have sure. to measure, and you say... Oh, um, you know the typical number. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't know. That's no. right. <laughs> um, let's say you have to measure a very large amount of samples. I would recommend yes. the 3 or the 4 okay. kilowatt. And I would also recommend, if you don't have any setup, I would recommend to use Cement Quant, which is our um, turnkey solution that provides you with standards. Mm -hmm. um, so you can actually set up everything at the day of installation so you're ready to run on day one or day two. First yeah. day installation, second day calibration. All right. Yeah, that's, it's kind of nice. It's like a little suitcase thing. It has all the little Correct. standards in it and really just takes you from starting to expert. Correct. Immediately. Um, and also our application person, right? We, we come out and we can uh, help you with achieving that too. Yes. So uh, next question from Sven. Uh, and the question there is, can you analyze sulfur in oil, in particular D2622? Yes. So D2622 is one of the standard applications okay. for the S8 because it's, a, again, an ASTM method mm -hmm. that needs to be, or that requires a WD system. Okay. Um, that's also a good example for maybe using the S6 because yes. the S6 can be customized more. So it, if you just put in one crystal, for example, the germanium crystal, you can make it just the machine that does D2622. Okay. Okay. And for that now, would... That would be like a liquid sample, right? Correct. So okay. you would measure it in a, in a mm -hmm. cup like this with a little, um, yeah. with a lid. And then on, on the bottom, there would be a thin film, yeah. obviously, to keep the m liquid or the powder in the cup. Okay. Yeah, I think I remember when you guys measured a bunch of those samples, too, because the, the building had a very interesting scent. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. I... <laughs> you bring in all the, that, that sulfury oil. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and check here. From uh, VJ, uh, what digit accuracy can we expect from the S8 Tiger after the decimal? This changes a lot. What? So, and what accuracy? So, what digit accuracy can we expect from the S8 Tiger after the decimal? So, I think that there's there's two bits here, right? There's let's make sure we're all clear on accuracy and precision. Correct. Right. So, what's the difference between accuracy and precision? So, we always use this like nice idea of um, uh, of a bullseye, yes. right? The accuracy is how close to the bullseye are you, and okay. the precision is, or like if, if the if the average of where you hit it is in the bullseye, yeah. Um, and then precision is how far spread out you are. Okay, so it. precision is you get the same number time and time again. Yeah. Accuracy is you get the right number. And those are two different things. So what Vijay is asking about is accuracy with the S8 Tiger. So it's a uh, it's kind of a, a calibration of correlation technique. Correct. So once you've calibrated the machine, uh, pick uh, you can pick an application that you're familiar well, with, maybe the number. And I, I also think that we're talking about weight percent, right? It's uh, not necessarily like yeah. Let's say I, weight percent. Let's do it. That, so so <laughs> if we say weight percent, if we yeah. talk about DS twenty six twenty two, okay, um, we can go down to ppm, right? So that okay. would be four decimals. Okay, so that would be our detection limit, or is that the... Um, but also the standard deviation of a calibration we set up, and if you run okay. a sample over and over, you would get a standard deviation that's even closer than the standard deviation of the calibration curve. All right, all right. And then you use the standards in order to make sure that that very precise measurement now is right on target. Correct. So you get the accuracy. All right, great. And with that... Wait, wait yes. let, me, let me elaborate on that, or add one more thing. Um, <laughs> Just to get an idea, um, 
the, the decimal points that you can definitely expect is like um, two usually is where we are. Um, yeah. That's also where C114 comes in. Okay. Um, and then if you have time, if you have mm -hmm. great standards, right? Um, XRF is very good at what goes in comes out. So yeah. if your standards have a precision of three des decimals, that's what you can expect from your results as well. Okay. And so much of this also depends on the, the person doing the experiment. Yes. The sample preparation is key. Uh, not only that you're executing properly, but that you're doing the right sample prep for that matter. Correct. It also is important to not only look at the elements that you're interested in, but all the elements that are present. Yes. So we sometimes have, that's especially something for food mm -hmm. and feed, because not everybody might be interested in silicon that might yeah. be in the in, yeah. in the plant matrix but it's there and it can influence the rest of it and so with the edxrf that's one good example yeah. because we measure the whole spectrum we don't have to spend extra time on it um, we can look at the spectra when the calibration is set up we can see oh the silicon changes a lot so let's yeah. take it into account oh the silicon is the same let's don't worry about it because okay. the influence will be the same for everything yeah. So, and you know, as you can hear, Julia is really an expert. We actually have a lot of Julias. No, we don't. There's only one Julia, but we do have a lot of people uh, located not only yeah. here in Madison, but around the world uh, to help people out with these pro problems. So if you do have a question that's very specific about your needs, um, I really, you know, suggest reach out to the vendor, uh, reach out to the people. They are always there to help. I mean, here at Brooker, we we spend a lot of time uh, talking with people and their, their individual stories, and we love to hear those stories. So please reach out to us. Um, if you do have a specific question, uh, in fact, that is the end of our questions here. So if you do have more questions, again, that email address, that's live.events at broker.com. Go ahead, send it there, and, and we will uh, get back to you. Um, otherwise, thank you, Julia, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's, it's very enlight It was very, very enlightening. So... Uh, until next time, though, let's make sure to keep your signal high and your background low.